In the previous video, we discussed the iliopsoas muscle group, which is composed of the iliacus muscle and the psoas major muscle. In this video, we're going to talk about the quadratus lumborum and the psoas minor. But first, the quadratus lumborum muscle. You can actually see it right here, actually descending down from the lateral arcuate ligament. There's actually a couple arcuate ligaments right here. Here's the lateral one, lateral arcuate ligament. And that's bigger than the medial one. This small one right here is the medial arcuate ligament. Uh, you'll notice that these two ligaments from a previous video actually are attachment points of a portion of the diaphragm above it. And then you can see that the quadratus lumborum actually emerges from beneath the lateral arcuate ligament. And later on, we'll see that the psoas minor emerges from beneath the medial arcuate ligament. Now, the origins of the quadratus lumborum are actually inferior, and the insertions are superior. So the fibers are going to run more or less vertically upward. So the origins are going to be down here at the iliac crest, you see right here. And then there's a little bit on the iliolumbar ligament uh, medially, which you can't see. It's covered up by the psoas major. And then here is the muscle belly of quadratus lumborum. The reason it's given the name quadratus is because the muscle itself kind of forms a rectangular shape. Okay? And then the muscle fibers run vertically upward, and they're going to insert on the inferior border of rib 12, and the transverse processes of vertebrae L1 through L4. Can't really see that here, so we'll switch images. You can see inserting on the inferior border of the 12th rib and on the transverse processes of L1, L2, L3, and L4. Now the actions of quadratus lumborum depend on if we're talking about bilateral contraction or unilateral. So for bilateral contraction of the quadratus lumborums, uh, it's going to involve fixation of rib 12 during inspiration and also weakly aiding in trunk extension. The major trunk extensor is going to be the erector spiny, okay? but the quadratus lumborum can assist with that, and we'll see later on that there's some clinical relevance to that, so keep that in mind. When the quadratus lumborum contracts unilaterally, so only right or only left, you get ipsilateral lateral flexion or ipsilateral side bending. In other words, if we only contracted the right quadratus lumborum, well then we get a little bit of right lateral flexion or right side bending. But again, there's a lot of other muscles that facilitate that, like the oblique muscles, and even a little bit of the erector spiny. But this does participate in that. Another action not mentioned here is the hip hike. So if you stand up and you hike your left hip up, that's going to involve contraction of the left quadratus lumborum, so ipsilateral hip hiking if you're standing. And you can technically also do that in sitting, although generally if somebody is going to hike their hip, they're doing it in standing, and it's normally as a gait compensation, although there are some reasons you might want to strengthen that movement, especially if the person has a pelvic drop on one side. Now the quadratus lumborum is innervated by the subcostal nerve, so T12, and it also gets contributions from the anterior rami of levels L1 through L4. And the blood supply is via the lumbar artery, the median sacral artery, the iliolumbar artery, and the subcostal artery. So what is the clinical relevance of the quadratus lumborum? Well, if it's overused or strained, it can lead to the development of low back pain. So if you have somebody who sits for long periods, like at a desk, maybe it's in a recliner, uh, but specifically it's in a reclined seat or a reclined position for long periods over time, it tends to release the intrinsic back muscles, and those would be the paraspinals, like the erector spiny or the multifidi, and it weakens them. And so if you have your major back extensors, your multifidi, which are more for stabilization, your erector spiny, which are the agonists or prime movers of trunk extension, and they're weak, well then how are you going to extend your back when you stand up and keep upright? Well, you're going to have to rely on another trunk extensor, and that's the quadratus lumborum. So the QL, as we often call it, is going to have to compensate. But the QL is used to having assistance from the erector spiny and the multifidi, but if they are weak, 
QL's got to do a lot more of the work. It's not designed to do that much work, and so it stiffens up and it causes pain. And another way that the QL can become overused is when somebody has unequal leg lengths that has gone untreated. So for the purpose of this, let's imagine that on the right side over here, the right leg is quite a bit longer than the left. So what that's going to do is it's going to push the right side of the pelvis up and the left side of the pelvis is going to be lower. That creates kind of this pelvic obliquity. So the left side is lower because that leg is shorter. So the body doesn't like that. It's going to try to normalize it and bring it back to this level right here. Well, how are you going to bring the left side of the pelvis up? Well, it's going to be the quadratus lumborum. Because notice, it's going to be able to elevate that side of the pelvis up. That's that hip hike we were talking about a few minutes ago. And if you have to do that all the time, that's going to lead to stiffening of the QL and pain. And again, that's due to a compensatory attempt to stabilize the pelvis and minimize that obliquity between left and right. All right, one final muscle here, and that's the psoas minor. We talked about the quadratus lumborum here, and it emerges down here from beneath the lateral arcuate ligament. Well, the psoas minor, which is this very thin muscle right here, emerges from beneath the medial arcuate ligament, which is right here where my mouse is. Now, notice the psoas minor, location-wise, is superficial or anterior to the psoas major. The psoas major is much bigger. Psoas minor is a very, very thin muscle, and you can see that it actually pretty quickly terminates into a very skinny tendon, which doesn't actually exit the pelvic cavity. It actually stays within. So the psoas minor is going to originate off of the vertebral bodies of T12 and L1. Here's a better picture to visualize that. So here's the vertebral body of T12, L1, very thin muscle. Goes down here, here's approximately the musculotendinous junction. It eventually becomes a tendon, very thin tendon, goes down here and inserts on the iliopubic eminence and the pectineal line of the pubis. So it never exits the pelvic cavity, unlike the psoas major behind it, which clearly does as it goes out to the lesser trochanter of the femur. Now, actions. It assists with trunk flexion. Now, trunk flexion, what's the prime mover of that? That's the rectus abdominis. We talked about that when discussing the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. Look how thin this muscle is and compare that to the size of the rectus abdominis. I feel pretty confident that you could literally surgically remove the psoas minor and you'd have perfect trunk flexion. This is a very small muscle and it likely doesn't contribute much to trunk flexion at all, uh, evidenced by two things. Number one, it's so small, it likely only has a proprioceptive function. So small, it's not going to really do anything for force production for trunk flexion. And the other thing is that a lot of people don't even have it. Now that being said, we're going to skip innervation and blood supply for just a minute and skip down to genetic variability, for which there's a lot in the case of psoas minor. The most common genetic variation is what we call a genesis. This is where the muscle just doesn't form, and so people don't have it. And a genesis is prevalent in about 33 to 52% of the population. That's a lot of people. You can look here at the five most common muscles to exhibit a genesis. So as minor is the most common one. But we also have the pyramidalis present in the anterior abdominal wall, peroneus tertius, palmaris longus, and plantaris. Interestingly, they all seem to start with a P. Not sure why. Now, there was a study that looked at cadavers to determine whether or not people had a psoas minor. They looked at 450 cadavers, and what they found is that in 183 of them, the psoas minor was absent bilaterally, meaning they did not have a right one, they did not have a left one. Out of those 450 cadavers, they also found 69 of them where there was a unilateral absence. So some people may have had a right one, but not a left, or they may have had the left one and not the right. So they only had a unilateral absence, which you could also think of as a unilateral presence. So again, the fact that some people just don't have this muscle and 
have perfect trunk flexion without it, suggests that this muscle really doesn't contribute anything to force production, it's so small, and it probably plays more of a proprioceptive function around the trunk. So as minor, if it was present, would be innervated by uh, the L1 anterior ramus, and its blood supply is via the lumbar arteries. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.